Okay, so Saki and I are going to tag team the data, hopefully very fast, hand off part way through. Um, first, I want to thank the committee for selecting our papers. Um, it's really an honor to be recognized as part of this group. Um, this is the uh, title and abstract of our paper. I'm not going to read it out if you've had a chance to do that. Now, uh, I'm instead going to give a brief overview of CODA with the aim of this uh, cartoon, which appeared uh, in a Japanese computer magazine in the early 90s. So on the left side, you see the uh, illustrated problem that CODA was uh, started to address. And that's, um, you see, uh, uh, two users who are in a client server distributed <laughs> system and they're currently partitioned from all the servers. And as a result, they can't get their work done. And this is very distressing. You can see by the kind of sweat loss literally jumping off their heads. Um, whereas on the right side, you see um, uh, a couple of co users who are happily continuing to do their work. Um, using this technique that we call disconnected operation, uh, even though they are partitioned from all the servers uh, at this moment. So the, the solution that we came up with to uh, implement, which to support disconnected operation, um, was to augment um, the caching subsystem that was already present uh, on cloud machines. Uh, we augmented it by adding a hoarding, we call a hoarding capability to bring data to uh, the user devices before disconnection. Um, lands as they grew to be campus size were actually quite brittle. Uh, servers crashed, and so availability is actually a problem in the wire space. It was only about, I don't know, six or 12 months into the project where this kind of light bulb went off, and there was this sort of happy accident uh, where we realized that um, mobile computers were going to become real that there were computers coming to market that were you know, a little bit smaller than the um, you know, blue platform-based machine we see here, uh, and that these would be great candidates for disconnected operation because you know, people would want to take them off-site, various places, environments, and so on. So we kind of did it, and um, from that point on, uh, really focused on uh, mobile environments, and I think uh, since then, code has really been recognized as one of the systems that um, you know, was there that kind of added to mobile computing. All right, so um, for those of you who may have kind of made a leap there from you know, one platform uh, size computer to today's smartphones and tablets, um, so let me kind of recalibrate you here uh, to the technology that was available at the time. Uh, these are actually the first two machines, sets of machines that were uh, code clients. Uh, this was about 1990. Uh, as you can see, they uh, each had about the uh, computing power of the light bulb today. Um, the one on the left weighed almost 20 pounds. It was really backbreaking to uh, take that around. Uh, and so, you know, my parents often like to say, they were a lot higher in the old days. Uh, the um, and last point I want to make before handing out to Satya is, um, as I was thinking about, you know, why um, uh, our paper may, uh, has been recognized as uh, a test time paper and, and uh, why code is a, a long new system. Uh, and one of the things that jumped out at me was the uh, the fact that we um, open sourced the system. Uh, with over some pretty significant obstacles, as I could tell you about uh, how we will cover it, what was the right words, and so on. But we persevered, we put the system online in 1995, uh, even created a little um, a user community with support for uh, people to install it and troubleshoot and so on. And uh, I think this was actually um, very significant. Um, at the time, this was not really standard practice for academic research projects. You had you know, things like Linux and GNU tools, which were uh, available on my academic research projects and typically put their code out there for, for people to try and use. And I think the effort that was, was uh, put in that person that I saw and people that came after me um, really helped to get the system out there uh, in use and um, uh, exposed it to 
student, lots of uh, grad students have also read the paper and the project and so on. So I'm going to move to stop here. Thank you very much, Jay. And I want to uh, join Jay and thank you the committee for selecting my work. Um, you know, this paper is old now. The paper actually was presented at SOSB in November 1991. And the 1992 paper is the ACM transactions uh, version of it. So that's 20 plus 25 years in the Networks are so much better. How can this still be relevant? So it's worth rereading the first two sentences of the paper. Every serious use of a distributed system has faced situations where critical work has been impeded by a remote failure. And it's frustrating, it's particularly acute when his workstation, so this in front of him, is powerful enough to be a standalone, but has been configured to be dependent on remote users. Now, 25 years ago, this was said in the context of distributed file systems. But today, those same words can be said about cloud computing. An unstated assumption about cloud computing today is that the cloud is all digital. Now, that may be true in benign environments, but let me share with you some examples. Of environments that this is not true. The most obvious is uh, military operations. The enemy's job is to continuously try and disrupt the communication with the cloud. If you have a disaster like Hurricane Sandy, you should have quite a bit of networking in this part of the country, um, the same observation applies. If you're in a developing country, the physical infrastructure looks like the picture on the bottom there. And the networking infrastructure is not much better. So the quality of connectivity, the bandwidth, all of those parameters are really bad. And the last one is perhaps the scariest. It's already been the case that we've had many, many instances where deliberate attacks on cloud services have disabled access to critical services. And it doesn't matter whether the failure was natural or man-made. You as a user cannot get to your service, your inconvenience, seriously. So this general concept of being able to operate temporarily using a fallback service provided by the machine in front of you is a very powerful idea. The general notion of preparing for it operating transparently during the period of occurrence and then putting the world back together at the end. That metaphor is, I believe, going to become increasingly important in cloud computing as we move forward. So if I have the time, if I have the time, I'd like to end with just four thoughts about this work looking back a quarter of a century later. So why did we build Coda? We built Coda because I used I built before before building Coda we built AFS along with a number of others. And we had failures. The more dependent I became on AFS, the more painful it was, and I couldn't get work done. So we really built out of need. And systems that you build out of necessity are very often the very best systems because they solve a real problem rather than an imagined problem. The second point is actually quite quite interesting. In computer science, we are very used to trade-offs. You did trade-off time for space, memory for CPU, bandwidth for some energy, for example. It's almost never that you get a twofer. This connected operation happens to be one of those rare instances. The caching that you're doing for performance go free if you do it right also gives you improved availability. So it's truly really precious. The third point is actually applicable directly to Che. Che, some of you may know, was my very first PhD student. So he has a very special place in my heart. Early when we were looking at this problem, we thought about this kind of operation. A lot of people said, oh, that sounds so horrible. When you start the slow and easy, maybe low bandwidth, and see how far you can get with that. Maybe because we were young and foolish, we 
we decided not to take that advice and took on the harder problem. And in hindsight, it was the best thing we ever did because it forced us to consider extreme situations that we might have been able to avoid, we might have been able to skirt, find workarounds, if we had even the tiniest band of the vehicle, but zero business again, pushed us very, very hard. And the last point is one that is also uh, very close to my heart, which is there's no substitute for a real working system. 